Well, welcome to the Daily Word, teaching ministry of Redeemer Bible Church in Gilbert, Arizona. My name is Tim, and I'm one of the pastors here. So in this episode, we are continuing on the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 9, verses 18 through 38. The second section of chapter 9 continues with more miraculous works of Jesus and an admonition, not an ammunition. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Well, this is the story of Jairus from Mark and Luke's Gospels that we can pick up in verse 23 and then circle back up to the woman who touched his garment. This will make sense. There's an interesting connection between these two stories, however. The child was 12, and the woman had suffered for 12 years, so 12 is a significant number. It contrasts the light of the child's life with the darkness of the women's journey. So verse 23 starts with, And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. It's interesting that the man worshipped him and he knew who he was. There are other moments in the New Testament where such worship is offered to a human, Acts 10, 25-26, or to an angel in Revelation 22, 8-9, but is always immediately refused. You can contrast this with the centurion who simply needed the word, not his presence, as opposed to the ruler who desired the actual presence of Jesus. I don't know if it indicates greater faith or simply just a different type of approach. Let's go back to verse 19. It said, And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to him, If only I touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Well, it appears that the suffering woman desired to receive healing from Jesus without drawing any attention to herself or her socially embarrassing problem. Jesus insisted on making public notice of her, and he did this for good reasons. One commentator describes it this way. He did it so she would know she was healed, having heard an official declaration of it from Jesus. He did it so others would know she was healed, because her ailment was private in nature. He did it so he he would know why she was healed, so she would know why she was healed, that it was by her faith and not because of a superstitious touch in and of itself. He did it that he would not think she had stolen a blessing from Jesus, and so she would never feel that she needed to hide from him. And finally, he did it so he could bless her in a special way, giving her an honored title we never see Jesus give to any other daughter. Jesus must have hated death. We know he does, and its cause, and enjoyed the opportunity to hand death a small defeat before he would defeat it altogether at the cross and the empty tomb. Well, on to verse 27, it says, And Jesus passed on from there. Two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about him. Not sure why he does that, because they always tell. And then they went away and spread his fame through all that district. Such a display from these men of faith. They had the faith to follow Jesus unseen. They had the faith to speak out, willing to put words to what they needed. They had the faith to cause a commotion in a public space. They had the faith to identify Jesus as the son of David, recognizing him as the Messiah. They had faith to ask Jesus for mercy, knowing they didn't deserve healing. And they had faith to believe that Jesus was capable of healing them. Let's go to verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon-possessed man who was mute was brought to them. But when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Well, in attributing the work of Jesus to the power of the devil, we see the opposition to the Lord ramping up as the Pharisees and other religious leaders, they were looking for their gotcha moment and they took no prisoners. They wanted it. Verse 35 says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, 
teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Well, the word that's used for move with compassion is a long word I'm not going to try to pronounce. It's the strongest word for pity in the Greek languages. In Greek language, it's described it describes the compassion which moves a man to the deepest depth of his being. Charles Spurgeon stated the original word is a very remarkable one. It is not found in classic Greek. It is not found in the Septuagint. The fact is, it was a word coined by evangelists themselves. They did not find one in the whole Greek language that suited their purpose, and therefore they had to make one. Well, the intensity and depth of his shepherd's heart is on display here. All these people that needed healing, one can only imagine his angst for lost sheep. This is, that is to be our model. Caring deeply for those who have not accepted Jesus, it should pain us and drive us to proclaim the good news. We all must have a shepherd's heart. Well, finally in verse 37, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest who sent out laborers into his harvest. It is just as true today as it would be back then. It can be overwhelming the work that is in front of believers. I would encourage you to not leave the so-called leave it to the so-called professional. We are all called to love, serve, and participate in the ministry of Jesus Christ. The word to ponder in this section is power, the awesome power of a Savior to heal and to deeply care at a level we should aspire to. Tomorrow we finish this week with a look at the latter part of our beginning, the beginning of Matthew chapter 10. Be good.